from our previous lesson a couple of weeks ago, like I mentioned, uh, we titled it, Were You Ready for This? This is the part two, um, COVID-19. I'm just going to have a little bit summary, maybe just a five minute summary of what transpired a couple of weeks ago. Uh, why all of a sudden we're having this message about um, fomentation um, or hydrothermal therapy. Um, based on the scriptures and document, uh, documentaries from the past uh, couple of weeks we've learned, we've um, said that, well, by God's grace, it, it's not unprecedented. There were a lot, we found there were a lot of similarity of the 1918 um, Spanish flu and this coronavirus, COVID-19. And we use these scriptures, um, that history repeat itself. So we accumulated all the research of CDC and the, uh, the World Health Organization and also some uh, um, documentaries out there. We find that, again, that 1918 was very similar of all the things that's happened um, of, uh, of what's happening now in COVID-19. Also, um, we took the 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that knowing the past will benefit. And so this is still part of that uh, uh, admonition that the Lord will give us. And lastly, we, uh, uh, from Amos chapter 3, verse 7, what the prophet revealed, that God will do nothing but he revealed his secrets to the prophet. And that knowing the time, we will know what to do. So, from, again, from that couple of weeks ago, there were a lot of inquiry. And I praise my brother, especially the one in Texas, uh, my brother Bob Wilkinson. Um, if you're watching, thank you, brother. He has encouraged me that uh, Lito, there, you know, it's, uh, he said, let's make this one practical. Um, let's see really about what happened in the, uh, back in the Hutchinson Institution back in 1918, where we see that 180, 120 exposed, 90 patients, no deaths, none very sick. That's quite interesting. And it's impeccable how God gives this timing for us. Like I mentioned, two weeks ago, we had this seminar, or we had this this, this re revelation about what's happening about COVID-19 and any similarity on the uh, 1918 flu. Just a week after that, which was last week on Sunday, um, I had an uh, uh, um, email from uh, AWR. Um, those who may not know AWR, it's the Adventist World Radio. And the, one of the uh, officers there now is Dr. Layla Lewis, which I work um, um, along with the pathway to health, if you guys really remember, uh, they had a symposium, symposium, I'm sorry, about this. Um, symposium, symposium, Adventist World Radio, AWR360. Like I have mentioned, Dr. Leila Lewis is the host in this, uh, uh, um, this lecture last Sunday. And she has a lot of um, uh, doctors, her colleagues, uh, I'll, um, I'll mention some, like Dr. Roger Schultz, um, pulmonary medicine, John Kelly, uh, epigenetics. I don't know if you can read those. I am barely can read them myself, too. Anyway, so a few more, like Dr. Eric Nelson. He's in the uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee medicine. And... Dr. Zeno Charles, M.D., Vice President for Medical Affairs. Uh, three, of, uh, yeah, three of these are actually still active in the Loma Linda. Anyway, so this notion, they mentioned about, what, it, it's interesting, they mentioned exactly what we were talking about two weeks ago. And their notion just happened to be last week. And it's just a revelation uh, what the Lord has um, timed it together. And this is actually the whole uh, notion, it's a symposium, it's about two and a half hours. I know that's a lot, right? But we're not going to show all of that. 
And so I, again, as you know, I like to take snippets here and there and put it together. But if you want the entirety of the whole two and a half hours, including the question and panel, after this, uh, by God's grace, after this uh, live streaming, I'll put it on the description, all the links, all the videos that I've used for this, okay? And without further ado, let's start with our first one, uh, as Dr. Leila will, Leila will introduce. I'm Dr. Leela Lewis, and I am the host of Adventist World Radio 360 Health. Today's topic is something that is exciting and very informational to all of us. We're going to be looking at novel lessons learned from the 1918 flu, and could those lessons possibly apply to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, lesson learned in the uh, 1918 flu. Is there any similarity? that we can take from that. And here, um, like we mentioned, we, here's the key. When, when we digged in to the information of what the Adventists did back in the 1918, uh, we saw this article about Hutchinson Institution makes a record combating the Spanish flu. And so there was in that article um, the success by God's grace that what they done was for uh, um, hydrotherapy and so that's what this is all about is can we use hydrotherapy in this uh, similar COVID-19 oh and by the way too I want to um, I want to include that this this series here uh, it, it, you can get a CME continuing medical education credits and after of course after all the videos of what we watch I will give you uh, Dr. They will tell you exactly where to get the credits, and we'll move on from that one. You know, that's the very question that each of us want to ask. Does this apply to us now? Is there any research since 100 years ago to involve the idea that hydrothermal therapy, hot and cold treatment, actually does boost the immune system? At this time, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Roger Schwelt. Dr. Roger Schwelt is a pulmonologist and intensivist. He's also assistant professor of medicine at Loma Linda University and co-founder of MedCram, an online educational company. Dr. Schwelt, we have a question for you. Does the science say hydrothermal therapy works today? Well, thanks, Layla. Thanks for inviting me on. And we've been tackling this very question uh, on, our, on our website. We've been looking at this. It's funny, you know, how mother, the uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And with this epidemic and what's going on right now, we are looking desperately for things that can help. And, and looking back far enough, we can find it. So that is the question. Does hydrothermal therapy work? What does the science say? As you notice, what I do with this thing, like I mentioned, I take a snippet of it. So you will see these videos between two minutes or five minutes. And because if we play the whole thing, um, all this medical uh, terminology is just going to go way beyond my head. Anyway, so this is by God's grace. This is what I understand and put it together. Again, if you want the whole series, uh, it will be in the uh, link uh, description after the live stream. Uh, Say, let's see, continue. Uh, Corona COVID virus, what makes this COVID-19 so deadly? And how does it attack our body? Here's what's next. Um, the immune system is made up of two different parts, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. You get both when you're born. The innate immune system is very powerful when you are first born. This is the part of the immune system that gives you a fever. This is the part that goes around eating up particles called the PAMPs or molecular patterns that look abnormal. And they present it to the adaptive immune system, which uh, finds it, remembers it, keeps memory cells of it. So the adaptive immune system, the one on the right, is the one that remembers vaccines. Uh, the one on the left is the one that goes out and scavenges and, and looks for particles. What we're finding out is that when we give an, a vaccine, that vaccine is going to cause memory cells on the right in the adaptive immune system, but there's a spillover of activation in the innate immune system. And as we're going to find out here very shortly, it's the innate immune system that seems to be crippled with this COVID-19.
So how does COVID-19 attack our body? It's through the innate immune system. The next video is going to compare about the coronavirus uh, family that was uh, 2002, we had SARS, and 2012 was MERS. What is the relationship or is there anything similarity in this? Here's what's next. So there was an article that was published out of a center of excellence in Thailand titled Immune Responses in COVID-19 and Potential Vaccines, Lessons Learned. And basically the point of this uh, article was to compare the first SARS virus in 2002 with the one in 2012, that was MERS. And those are both coronaviruses. And to use the understanding of that in comparison to what's going on right now with SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19. And in this article, they pointed out a number of interesting things. Number one, that an increase in neutrophils and a decrease in lymphocytes was very similar to the prior two infections. And this correlated with an increased chance of death. Um, they, it's well known that the first SARS virus and MERS both suppress the innate immune system and that COVID-19, the current one, may dampen antiviral IFN responses resulting in uncontrolled viral replication. You know, that's something that we've seen a lot of is people just are infected for a long period of time and they just can't kill the virus and get better. So what's going on there? They, they definitely say that there's an issue with the innate immune system and that it's suppressed at first and then allowed to go into overdrive, causing potentially that cytokine storm. And I think this paragraph in the article uh, really says it. They say, based on the accumulated data for previous coronavirus infection, innate immune response plays a crucial role in protective or destructive responses and may open a window for immune intervention. Active viral total neutrophils and lymphocytes during COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 probably induces a delayed type 1 IFN and long viral control in an early phase of infection. Individuals susceptible to COVID-19 are those with underlying diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. In addition, no severe cases were reported in the young children. This is at that time. When innate immune response is highly effective, these facts strongly indicate that innate immune response is a critical factor for disease outcome. And we can see here, here's another paper that was published back in 2004 on the first SARS virus that notices that these natural killer cells are at a very low percentage in comparison to a regular bacterial infection. There's another paper that was published in Nature Medicine. This was recently published just last month that took a woman who was in China infected with COVID-19 and was hospitalized in Australia. They did an essential workup on her and noted that yes, her monocytes and natural killer cells were suppressed. Very interesting. Who is at risk? Who is at risk of a suppressed innate immune system? Those with underlying diseases. Also, including diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular. You know, like what I mentioned earlier, that God's timing is impeccable. About a year and a half ago, God um, impresses us to do a diabetes undone. It's interesting what we've learned from this diabetes undone about a year, a year and a half ago is exactly these diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. You know, it is not a coincidence. My friend, God is, I praise the Lord that He's working through us at Norwalk and everywhere, of course, that is giving this thing in a timely manner. And let me just plug in real quick of the diabetes undone as a testimony. We have quite a few of them, but I'll give you one. Uh, we have brother over here, uh, Christian Salazar. He was one of our, um, uh, shall I say, patient that went to the diabetes undone. Make the long story short, he, he, he got the message and he's actually lost, I think, 40 some pounds. And so it's quite interesting now that he's more healthier, he's got more energy, like he's just excited. Um, I wonder what happened if we didn't have the diabetes undone. Interesting. God is really working in a perfectly timed manner. Moving forward, let's... Take in a short summary, summary on this section, I think a good working hypothesis would be that SARS-CoV-2 infection down-regulates innate immunity. 
and that SARS-CoV-2 is allowed to progress because innate immunity is not strong enough. And that strengthening that innate immune system might be a place to stop COVID-19, especially in this very sensitive phase two, uh, where not much is being done. Patients are being sent home from the hospital and asked to stay there and isolate until they get worse. Is there something that we can do in this very long stage, about seven days, it seems like on average? You're going to keep hearing again these, uh, these phases. What are these phases that are mentioned? Uh, he's going to keep mentioning phase one, two, and three. Like I said, because I cut off these two and a half hour video to compile it in 45 or less minutes. And I was going to explain it, but I found one of his video. It's just clearly, uh, it's just remarkable that Dr. Ro uh, Roger Schultz um, uh, said this. And here it is. He's going to explain it to us. Okay, I wanted to review again exactly what it is that's going on with this coronavirus infection. First of all, at day zero, when somebody becomes infected, there's about a five-day period where there is no symptoms. We call that the incubation period. And let's say that of all the people that become infected, they won't show signs during those five days. And so this is at 100%. And then over the next seven to eight days, so by the time we get to day 12, there's going to be a pretty dramatic drop off in the number of patients that are gonna have issues. So that we are down to approximately at this point, 20%. And the reason for this drop is really for one reason, and that's the host's immunity, your immune system. need to be hospitalized because of pneumonia, shortness of breath, etc. And so they will go into the hospital at this point. The specific part of your immune system that is really hammering this virus and is the reason why 80% exit this cycle and they don't need any more care, it seems as though based on the studies that we looked at last time was because of innate immunity. And this is the portion of the immune system that is very strong in terms of taking care of these viral pathogens. It is the monocytes, it's the natural killer cells. Remember in our last video, we showed you that these monocytes, which should be up here in terms of frequency, are actually down here. They are impaired. Remember our timeline. When a patient has symptoms at five days and goes to the emergency room, what is told to him is for him to go back home because he doesn't meet the admission criteria to go in the hospital. Meanwhile, the virus is making inroads on the patient and is suppressing the immune system until finally the house is fully inflamed and the patient is admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. And what we've been doing up to this point for COVID-19 in this country is we've been trying to improve and increase the resources at the hospital in terms of ventilators, in terms of rooms, in terms of medications, and in terms of staffing to meet that demand of 20% who will eventually need to be hospitalized. And the question that remains is, is there some simple remedy that could be investigated that would be available in someone's home that they wouldn't have to go to the store to buy, that a production company wouldn't have to deliver? Is there something simple enough that can reduce this curve enough to bring down the demand at the hospital and prevent this overwhelming tsunami of patients that require healthcare delivery. Isn't that remarkable how he explained that about those phases? So he's targeting on these phase number two, as you have heard. And so with this between five to 12 days, it's actually a seven day period here, right? And that's the question is, what can we do? Can we do something about in this stage over here? We'll move on. Okay, so up to this point, we've looked at real people. We've looked at cells, though, as surrogates for a good immune system against viruses. Let's actually put it to the test. And here we have a article asking that very question. Does regular sauna bathing reduce the incidence of common colds? They took 50 people that had never been in a sauna before. 
This was an Austrian study, and 25 of them stayed out of the sauna and they were used as controls. The other 25 had sauna bathing to see if they could reduce the incidence of common colds. And what they found was this. In the six months time that both groups were recording how many common colds they got, there was significantly fewer episodes of common cold in the sauna group. This was found particularly during the last three months of the study period when the incidence was roughly cut in half compared to controls. And so they concluded that regular sauna bathing probably reduces the incidence of common colds, but they felt that further studies were needed to prove this. And you always need further studies to make sure that what you're looking at is real. Here in an editorial, Dr. Ernst, who was the one responsible for publishing the sauna Austrian study, says here, Nevertheless, it seems unwise to advocate sauna indiscriminately. Thus, whenever in doubt, a medical checkup is mandatory. Once this is done, sauna can be fun and relaxing. So we take Dr. Ernst's statement at its face value, but the question is a deeper one. Does this heat and then cold help prevent and treat coronavirus-19? Of course, the answer to that question is we don't know at this point because there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial looking at that specifically. But then again, there hasn't been a randomized placebo-controlled trial in anything that we're using for COVID-19 at this point. Now, I know this is a long video, but I needed to get some more in here because it's just so interesting. So this was a paper that was published back in 2016 by the Salk Institute and very interesting review of all of the data that was pertinent to their study that looked at this idea of hyperthermia and hypothermia. This initial proposal made by Kluger in the 1970s only considered the fever response beneficial for host defenses. However, we suggest that both fever and hypothermic responses are strategies of the host to optimize host defenses during infection Indeed, there is evidence to suggest that both fever and hypothermic responses are beneficial for the host in the context of an array of diseases. So the more I thought about this, the more I started to think about the Finnish sauna. Here is a population of people that use the sauna extensively. So here you have the Scandinavian countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden Finland's technically not a Scandinavian country, but they're all considered Nordic countries. And so they're all about in the same place. But while the Finns extensively use saunas on a regular basis, maybe even two to three times a week, not so much so in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, although they are used to some extent. There's about 5.5 million people in Finland, and there's estimated to be about 2 million saunas. So I got this idea to look up some of these Nordic countries on Worldometer, realizing, of course, that even though they're very similar in nature, there could be some confounding variables that make them different. But if this kind of hot and cold that is being experienced, if this could help the innate immune system, and if, in fact, it's the innate immune system that is deficient in a COVID-19 case, then we would expect to see some sort of improvement if it was worthwhile so let's look at some of the numbers. And so again, this type of a study really doesn't prove anything. It can be affected by when the virus started in each of these respective countries and where they are along the process, but it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. So what I decided to do was take the different countries, so Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and I put here approximately the population of each of these countries. So Denmark being 5.6 million, and so you can pull these numbers right off of Worldometer. What about total deaths? So this is an interesting question because perhaps if the immune system is amplified with the sauna and the cold bathing, maybe it wouldn't prevent you from getting the infection, but it might prevent you from going towards cytokine storm and getting a pneumonia. So we might see a difference in the total deaths. Let's take a look. And in Finland, 11. Interesting. What about total deaths per million? What about new deaths for today? It's going to be interesting to keep track of this data as things go on. There is another culture that also likes to have very hot baths and then cool down afterwards, and that is the Japanese. And in looking at their numbers, they're not doing too badly. Again, could be confounders, but we need to look at this from the microscopic level and the macroscopic level as well. Wow, isn't that amazing? 
Finland, out of 5.5 million, only two total deaths. Of course, this record here, is, it, it was taken about, I believe, two and a half weeks ago. But still, the, the ratio of that is just astounding. Um, I hope you don't go rush to Costco and start buying those saunas now. You know, it, they're not that cheap, by the way. But there is another alternative. But it just makes sense about this hot and cold therapy. This is quite interesting. All right, um, let's uh, move on to our next video. So that kind of brings us back to our graph. And here we have the population. And what we're trying to do is isolate, which is trying to prevent the number of people from getting infected, which is represented here by this first bar. Then we have symptoms. And there's about 20% of these people who are infected, which will end up at the hospital. And what we're trying to do there is increase the capacity at the hospital by getting ventilators by making sure that our healthcare workers have personal protective equipment, by getting more beds, by getting nurses and respiratory therapists and ancillary services ramped up. But also, we are doing randomized controlled trials so we can have medications to treat people with. So we're working a lot here at this end, and that happens only when the patient comes to the hospital after they have shortness of breath and pneumonia. And we're doing a lot here at this end to make sure that only a small portion of the population actually gets the infection. And I think those are all important things that we should do. But when the patient comes to the emergency room here and is told to go home and not come back unless they have symptoms of shortness of breath, we are doing a lot of nothing in this period of time here when the immune system, I believe, needs help. And remember here, if we have a situation where... 80% of the people who get the infection are going to do well, and it's this 20% that needs to come to the hospital. If we can just improve that immune function by a few percentage points, five percentage points, then what we're doing is we're only having 15% going to the hospital. If you can drop this 20 down to 15%, then that there represents a 25% reduction and the number of people needing ventilators, needing beds. What's also important here is that whatever it is that you need to do here, it has to be something that doesn't have to be produced. You don't have to go to the store to buy it. And the nice and interesting thing about hydrothermal therapy, if in fact this works, and we don't have randomized placebo-controlled trials that show us that it works, but if it does work, it's something that anybody can do. Wow, really interesting, really interesting. Even if we can just lower it with 5%, it makes a huge difference, impact on our hospital where they are having trouble at this point. And where we are right now is, we have to remember something, that the good is not the enemy of the perfect. There is no FDA approved medication or treatment for COVID-19. There are many therapeutics that are being looked at, and some are very promising. So we've got to look at this good versus perfect. I mean, look at the CDC website. If you don't have personal protective equipment, they're actually recommending that you use a bandana or a scarf. That's because, well, what else do we have? We don't have studies on bandanas and scarves, but we've got to do the best that we have with what we have. Keep in mind that if we come up with a medication that works beautifully and perfectly, how are we going to scale up that amount of medication that fast at this point in time? The day that it was announced that hydroxychloroquine was going to be a good medication and promising, you couldn't get it in the pharmacies. And so we have to take things with uh, some understanding. Physicians right now, and I'm on the front lines as well, I've been treating patients last week with COVID-19. We don't have all of the answers, we don't have all the evidence, but we have to use what we've been given. And that's the definition of compassionate use. Yeah, absolutely. There is no FDA approval if you're using those bandanas or homemade masks. And so we really have to use our common sense. Or is it so common that what happened already back then could benefit us? We'll continue some more. What can we do? Now we're going to dwell in about the hydrothermal therapy, right? And did it work before? I think it did. And if it did, what method did they use? 
Here I'm going to introduce um, Dr. John Kelly, epigenetics. He has been doing this hydrotherapy, and we'll just give him a little glimpse of uh, what he says about hydrotherapy. I'll be talking about uh, another aspect of uh, hydrothermal therapy. Um, next slide will show that it's, I'm going to be talking about the aspect that has to do with the, what we might call the outpatient phase or the first part of Dr. Sweld's uh, uh, phase two, the 80% that don't need the hospital. As the next slide shows, I'll be talking about treatments just like those that were reported in the Life and Health Journal issue May 1919 that we've been speaking of, different ones have talked about tonight. You know, one of the more important uh, and prominent hydrother hydrothermal therapies used in the Spanish flu pandemic was called a fomentation. We've already heard that term tonight. We might better refer to it today perhaps as uh, moist heat packs. As the next slide shows, here I have a couple of pictures. Uh, we see that the uh, on the left, the photo from that issue that uh, demonstrating the nurse uh, putting a hot foot bath uh, to the patient who's uh, subject who's in bed. Uh, we want to keep them warm. And the photo on the right shows actually, uh, I'll be talking here in a minute, about the moist heat pack being wrapped in thick towel to keep it from injuring the skin. Okay. By the way, this is a two-part series. The first part this today, which is probably going to take about 45 minutes or so, uh, this is all about what science, what uh, it does and what it does not. The second part, we're going to take about 15 or 20 minute break, and then we'll do another series, this time the actual, um, how to do the foot and exactly what uh, Dr. John is referring to will be here, okay? But the next video, it is very encouraging. Now, Eric Nelson, um, Dr. Eric Nelson in the Chattanooga Medicine, um, they actually are already doing it. Listen. Hello, thank you for the privilege of uh, being on this August panel. I'm very privileged to uh, be here and talk about our inpatient protocol for providing hydrothermal therapy to non-ICU COVID-19 positive inpatients. I want to thank uh, Dr. Greg Steinke for his work in developing this protocol and implementing it as a hospitalist here in the Chattanooga area. We're very excited. We just got our IRB approval uh, three days ago, and we've already got one or two patients on the study. If you want to go to my next slide, it describes our protocol very briefly. Uh, it involves 25 minutes of heating pad treatment to the chest, followed by about a one or two minute thermal lock as Dr. Schwelt described, provided by a cool or cold moist towel. The patient's then dried thoroughly and warm blankets are replaced. This is repeated approximately four times per day. As you've already heard from the other presenters, there's a variety of methods whereby uh, you can apply heat to the body. We've personally chosen the Thermofor heating pads to maximize patient and nursing safety. This reduces the number of trips in and out of the patient's room. And of course, every trip in and out of the patient's room requires the nurse to burn through some of that precious personal protective equipment that is so scarce right now. So uh, we're using a thermophore uh, heating pad. If thermophores uh, become too scarce and we run out, uh, we do have bear huggers. And if a negative pressure room is available, Dr. Steinke's had some experience using uh, bear huggers as well. But of course, the, um, the blowing air with the bear hugger does give some some safety considerations in light of um, aerosolization. In, in addition to uh, standard hemodynamics, we're monitoring skin temperature and systemic temperature in a way that doesn't require the nurse to enter and exit the room. The goals of this trial are to activate the presumed immune modulating benefits of hydrothermal therapy. You've already heard from other presenters, uh, and I personally believe that the sudden temperature changes induce at least a demargination of uh, white blood cells, and perhaps this allows them to redistribute throughout the body. In addition, some of the basic science that Dr. Schwelt presented demonstrates an activation of the innate immune response at a cellular level. Uh, there's, of course, also immune modulating benefits to the body's fever response, as Dr. Kelly just mentioned. We're hoping to induce a fever, but not above 104 degrees. 
We do, of course, have some exclusion criteria. Any patient with history of uncontrolled arrhythmias, pregnant patients, a uh, patient that has secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis with an H score of 169, uh, that indicates they're pretty close to a cytokine storm. And although it may be that hydrothermal therapy is helpful in that, uh, we're not willing to risk this in this feasibility case control trial. Our primary outcomes of interest are length of stay and disposition. Did the patient go to the intensive care unit or did they go home? Uh, we've dichotomized our oxygenation variable, although we might uh, con collect some additional data on that. And of course, for secondary outcomes, we have lots of lab parameters that we're testing as part of the uh, overall protocol that our hospital follows. We're simply adding hydrothermal therapy to the protocol that our hospital already has put in place. I'd like to end by um, inviting any watching physicians who treat COVID-19 positive patients in the inpatient setting to consider implementing this or some similar protocol. Hopefully many centers can get IRB approval to collect data. And if similar protocols are used, perhaps meta-analysis of data in the future uh, will be possible, increasing statistical significance for any findings. That you see my email on the screen, my personal email address. I am happy to share our protocol detailed nursing instructions that Dr. Steinke has developed, our data collection sheets, consent forms, uh, any basic science papers, uh, such as the one that describes the H score, et cetera. I'm happy for you to modify them to fit your own needs in your own setting. Again, you see my email, enelson06m at yahoo.com. I want to thank you in advance for considering not only the patients you're currently treating, but the need to expand the evidence basis for treating future patients with hydrothermal therapy. I'll be happy to take any questions during the question and answer period. Thank you for being part of this call. It is very generous that Dr. Eric is sharing their, their collaboration and their stat with the folks. He even gave his personal email address. But it is exciting that now they are actually using it. And what he mentioned three days ago, this video, uh, it was uh, captured last Sunday, so it actually was last week. So I'm assuming that they're probably getting more and more patients in these things. And some of the protocols that they're applying, it is a, it's a dynamic protocol at this point. So they're, they're doing more and more of testing. But it's a good news. Now they're recognizing it as the, uh, another alternative in this COVID-19, how to fight the immune system. What I'm going to introduce you to next is Dr. Zeno Charles, uh, Marcel MD. Now, um, as he's going to say, he's going to play a little the skeptics. See what's, um, well, let's go hear what he says. At this time, Dr. Char Dr. Zeno Charles Marcel is going to present to us specifically what the science says and what the science does not say. Dr. Zeno. Thank you, Leila. You know, I'm going to be somewhat skeptical. I'm going to play the skeptic because we have all of this uh, good information and we have uh, good studies, but we always have questions that we need to answer. So I'll start with the first, with a case. Okay, here's a case of a 70 year old man, 11 day history of fever and delirium, who has the influenza. This was during the time of the pandemic back in 1918. By the time he presented to the sanitarium, he was unconscious. His temperature was 103 Fahrenheit or 39.4 centigrade. He had edema of the neck. He had redness and inflammation of his throat. He also uh, had uh, inflammatory edema of the left lung. That's what they called it in those days, uh, similar to bronchial pneumonia. And uh, they, he had a distribution that was consistent with that. His physician, had become ill and left, but had given the patient's daughter the opinion that undoubtedly death of this man would occur within two days. Well, they got a nurse to come and uh, apply the treatments. They used the treatment regimen that they uh, were using back then for the pandemic pneumonia. And this was applied at 4 p.m. in the evening. The nurse saw no discoverable change in his condition. However, the next morning by eight o'clock, the physician who was visiting saw that the patient was conscious, 
no delirium. Treatment was repeated twice uh, during the days and uh, attention was uh, made to the throat and within a matter of days, one week, he was back to normal, completely recovered. The question is what produced this outcome? What was it? Was it was it just the hydrothermal therapy or was it other stuff that was being done that just was not recorded, that were not recorded? Here's another case, a 30-year-old woman, ill for four days. Uh, she was in the, in the midst of the uh, 1918 pandemic of Spanish flu. Nothing was being done for her. She had a temperature of 105 Fahrenheit or 40.6 Celsius. She was delirious and became unconscious with large areas in her back. You know what we see in the hospital and sometimes when people are getting ready to die. This is what she looked like. She had poor circulation and, uh, and they thought, well, she was a goner. She had shifting uh, crepitus in her lungs, mostly over the back, much worse on the dependent side, yet she didn't have any uh, specific consolidation. Uh, but they thought it was severe pneumonia associated with this Spanish flu. They quickly applied the treatment, the hot foot bath, the hot packs on the, to the chest, front and back, and uh, they combined this with the cold uh, mitten uh, friction rub, which is a, a, a cold treatment uh, right afterwards. This was given twice a day. Two days of treatment seemed nearly unavailing, but then on the third day, clear mind, temperature back to normal. After five days of treatment, everything was back to normal. She survived. And the question again is what produced that outcome? Researchers and medical professionals are racing all around the world to find pharmaceutical solutions and to create a vaccine. But we have a history of this modality being used along with other things. We have plausibility of how it can be done. We also have molecular mechanisms that demonstrate that this is not something fly by night. It's not something uh, weird. It's actually scientifically demonstrable through the heat shock proteins and other mechanisms. So we have indirect evidence that this is something that is useful and probably helpful. Hydrothermal therapy is relatively low risk. It is perhaps an adjunctive uh, approach to lifestyle measures and lifestyle practice. We don't believe that it's a panacea. But while future hydrothermal therapy research is needed and absolutely needed, in the meantime, hydrothermal therapy probably won't hurt and it may help. While we search for definitive solutions, therefore, what have we to lose to try something that is so simple? Yeah, as he mentioned, hydrothermal therapy probably, probably won't hurt and it just may help. This is one of the last video and now um, just want to mention that this protocol is not an alternative to standard medical care. It is to be used in addition to the standard medical care, as uh, our doctor Roger will explain. Um, basically, this is where we are right now. We have two sets of two choices. It either works or it doesn't work. We either do it or we don't do it. And if we have the benefit of having randomized controlled trials down the line, and we're at that area down the line, we're going to know looking down from above whether or not it works or it doesn't work. But we're not there right now, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we're in the here and the now. And so the only way we can look at this is from the horizontal side. Do we do it or do we not do it? And you can see there, looking at it horizontally, there's a negative in both of those camps. Of course, if you do it and it works, that's a good thing. If it doesn't work and you don't do it, well, that's a good thing. But if it doesn't work and you do it, then you could be wasting resources and time. Uh, if, it, if it does work and you don't do it, well, there's people that could have been saved that didn't save. So we can only choose from the horizontal side to do it or not do it. And so the question is, would you rather 
do something that doesn't work or not do something that does work. And so, and that really, what it boils down to is the risks and benefits, as Dr. Marcel had mentioned. So the problem is, is though, that there are millions and millions people, of people around the world that fit into this uh, phase two. And so really, what is the perfect intervention that you can do in a phase two? Remember, we're dealing with millions and millions of people that are in phase two potentially. So number one, and this is really important, it has to be complementary with current medical care. This is not something where we're saying, just do this and forget everything else. You don't need anything else. No, please, this is not what we're saying. This is to be complementary with the current medical uh, situation that you're dealing with. It has to be whatever this intervention is going to be. It has to be scalable to millions of people right away, okay? This cannot be the equivalent of toilet paper on the shelf at Costco, right? You've, you've got to be able to say, this is what we're going to do, and it's available for everybody to get, and they not have to go out to their pharmacy or perhaps get a test. You know as an individual when you're not feeling well. So if you need to get a test for COVID-19, by all means, but it's got to be something that should be able to be started without a test because we just don't have that kind of testing. And if you think about this, let's think about uh, other people other than ourselves. What do we do in prison camps? What do we do in refugee camps? What do we do in countries that don't have the same kind of health care that, that we have, um, that they don't have access to this, they don't have access to the, the type of things that we're talking about? I think the key here is the understanding that we need to get the basal temperature up and depending on what your surroundings are, then those are the tools that you use to do it. And everybody has water at home. Everyone has towels for the most part. Um, and these aren't things that are scarce resources. These are things that you can do and take advantage of. So it really boils down to uh, risks versus benefits. And that decision is going to be between a patient and a physician or a patient who understands things through their physician, what their risks are. You know, right now, given all of those characteristics of a phase two intervention. What other alternatives do we have right now? We are months away from a vaccine. We are months away from a randomized placebo controlled trial currently. The one that we have the most data on it seems right now is hydroxychloroquine, which is a politically loaded question at this point, and it's still very difficult to find. Um, again, what's the risks of using a medication like that? I'm using medications like that in the hospital because we're trying to do everything that we possibly can. We are not making the good the enemy of the perfect. You know, how long is it going to take, as we mentioned, a vaccine and, and medications? Because really, when you think about it, Layla, in the time that we've taken just here right now to talk about this, in the last 90 minutes, based on the current numbers that we're getting, another 381 people around the world have died from COVID-19, at least. Those are the ones that we've documented. So my call out to people out there is to, is to really the purpose of this symposium, the reason why you're here, the reason why I'm here, is to raise awareness to this possible, uh, possible adjunctive therapy for COVID-19. If you're in the healthcare industry, to raise awareness where you are working, that this could be a potential possibility. If you're um, not in the healthcare industry, if you're watching this and you're a patient, to do more studying and learn more about this and to um, affect your lives and other people's. Wow, it's amazing. You know, more and more now are being, uh, the test in, 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 in cities now here in America, the test is being um, available. I don't know in your state, it's already have it, but here in the Los Angeles area, the test is already being uh, conducted since the last about a week and a half ago. And so as the test comes in, I believe we will see more and more of that new cases will come up. And it's a perfect timing what they're going to do because more majority are in the phase number two category. And again, it's an impeccable timing where the Lord brings this message to us. So the last we we're going to um, show here is uh, Pastor Mark Finley about whole person care. Where is God throughout all of this? Well, I've been asked to talk a little bit about whole person care. What is whole person care? It's a comprehensive philosophy of health that recognizes that human beings are much, much more than biological machines. They're more than a collection of organs and tissues and cells. 
whole person care looks at all dimensions of life, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And as a theologian, when I looked back at what was taking place in 1918 in these 21 sanitariums that had such outstanding results with the Spanish flu, certainly they were doing the hydrothermal therapy. They had a program of uh, dietary uh, concern, dietary reform, really, and they were largely on a vegetarian diet in these sanitariums. Uh, they were using rest as a therapy, but there was another aspect of therapy. These were Seventh Avenue institutions where the doctors and nurses believed in the power of prayer. They believed that there was a supernatural element in the healing process. They believed in this complete, comprehensive health program, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. In some of the recent studies, 94% of the patients today said that spiritual care, in one study that I read, was as important as medical care for the whole person care. In fact, 77% of the patients in that study said that a physician should be concerned about the spiritual care of their patients as well as the, the medical care of them. When you look at scripture, the model here is Jesus. Jesus is the model physician in whole person care. He opened blind eyes. He unstopped deaf ears. He healed deadly diseases. He restored demoniacs who were mentally insane. He fed hungry multitudes. He forgave sins and inspired thousands with new hope. Jesus valued human beings from all stratas of society. His unselfish ministry flowed from a heart of love to every individual that his life touched. You know, the scriptures say that Jesus went about doing good. And Christ said this. Christ said, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am so impressed with physicians, nurses, medical professionals, who are in the front lines today, who long to see men and women whole, who risk their own lives. You know, often as a theologian, I'm asked, where is God in all this? Where's God in COVID-19? And my response is this, he's in the heart of every physician who's on the front lines ministering in love. He is in the heart of every medical practitioner who's serving unselfishly and revealing compassion. He is there with every nurse on the front lines of service. He's with the neighbors as they give loving care to their neighbors. He's with spouses who serve one another in crisis. He's with every person whose body is racked with pain, and he's there to give them comfort and encouragement. I was interested in a statement that Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases made today. He was asked on this Easter Sunday, what role does faith play in healing? And Dr. Fauci talked about his own father and how his father was a man of faith. And he talked about the fact that in his own medical practice, although that he is an eminent scientist and researcher, he said that he believed that faith was one of the ingredients that strengthened the immune system, that release positive chemical endorphins from the brain that help to produce healing. And so as a medical uh, practitioner, as a theologian, I want to salute you. I want to thank you for being on the front lines. Thank you for understanding this concept of whole person care, that when you're there at the bedside, that you are dealing not with a collection of a bio, of biology merely, not simply with a biological uh, machine, not a collection of organs, tissues, and cells, but that you're looking at that person. You're concerned about that individually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And sometimes there are questions that we can ask. If a person is able to, if they're conscious and able to, to, to dialogue with us, we might ask them, where in a time of crisis do you find a source of strength? And sometimes the person will open up and talk about their own 
relationship with God, we might ask a question. May I pray with you? And as we do that, it can produce strength. And other per- people have confidence in physicians that have a connection with the Most High. So I salute you for being physicians on the cutting edge of medicine, physicians who are willing to try new methods of hydrothermal therapy and participate in whole person care. So as Jesus said, men and women and boys and girls can have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you, Leila. Amen, amen. So with the time allotment, I've noticed it's been an hour already. So I may skip some of these videos. I believe that should be our last. Anyway, I'm just going to mention about, again, this uh, CME, how to obtain your credit on this information. Um, I'll probably just show this last, uh, it's less than a couple of minutes. Dr. Leda will show you how to obtain your CME credit information. We want to talk to you very briefly. Uh, we've heard it mentioned several times over for ongoing research opportunities. Again, this is something that was we all really want to offer. For those of you who are interested, you can join our Facebook group. Again, you can access that if you're not able to write this number down. You can access that through awr.org forward slash health and just join the Facebook group. In addition to that, next slide please, we want to discuss with you very briefly, again, there are lots of other principles that we've touched on just briefly. Many of our panelists have agreed that next Sunday at the exact same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, we will have Symposium Part 2. Again, CME credits are available, and you are welcome to join us. Again, next week, we're planning to look at ultraviolet radiation and open space. You're not going to want to miss that. And again, exciting information. Again, finally, as far as the CMEs are concerned, you do not have to have attended this live in order to get CME credits. If some of your colleagues were unable to attend today, please feel free to access the archived video, and we will be linking that again to the various locations where you watched this. And you will be able to, or your colleagues will be able to watch the presentation, and then again, go to the website awr.org forward slash health, and enter your information to obtain your CMEs. Amen. So um, again, if you want to watch the entirety of this um, series, it's about almost three hours long. It includes the question uh, uh, and answer panel, uh, which I will put the link on this video after the uh, streaming. But stay tuned. Uh, it's about 4.04. Four right now I'm looking at my clock here we're gonna take about oh about 25 minutes we'll go back again at, at, uh, we'll take a break but all this um, um, absorption of these terminologies and it's a wonderful news and so we'll take a break and we'll be back at 430 and that 430 430 will show you how to do the fermenta- uh, fermentation and and uh, and the uh, foot bath and so without uh, further ado I'm um, gonna close this up with uh, Revelation, the three angels' message, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of water. After all, whether therefore you eat or drink, in whatsoever we do, we do all for the glory of God, even in hydrotherapy. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Tune in at 4.30. Thank you.
the birth of earth and sky and sea.